Welcome, my friends, to Stay Home, Stay Focused. I'm Jack Moline. I'm the president of Interfaith Alliance, and uh, we're glad to spend these uh, 20 minutes with you uh, today so that we can help you focus on something that is outside our national and rightful obsession with the coronavirus. My guest today is Zinat Rahman from the Inclusive America Project. Zinat, uh, like many of us, has a slightly unstable uh, internet connection. So if she fades for a minute, don't worry, we'll have her right back. Zinat, first of all, how are you and your family doing? Rabbi Moline, it's so good to be with you. Thank you for having me. Last time we were together was in Birmingham, Alabama. Feels That's right. Like a very long time ago in a very different circumstance. Um, we are doing well. Um, we are um, balancing elder care with child care and working, and we're just grateful for every day that we have together. Well, I certainly hope that you, like, like all of the people who are watching and listening, uh, will continue to uh, stay, stay home and stay well and stay safe. Um, Zinat, I, I want to uh, ask you to first introduce yourself just a little bit and tell us a little bit about the Inclusive America Project. Sure. So my name um, is Zina Rahman, and I'm the director of the Inclusive America Project at the Aspen Institute. Um, I come to this work from about uh, two decades of work doing interfaith and faith-based uh, community development. I uh, began my career at the Interfaith Youth Corps in this, my career in this space at the Interfaith Youth Corps. I then jumped to international development, made a move to Washington, D.C., um, and worked at USAID and learned um, about the contribution of faith-based communities to our international development and relief efforts around the world, learned a ton, um, and then went to the State Department where I focused on youth issues, um, which was, I would say, adjacent to this work. And so, of course, identity um, development and formation, faith identity is a big part of uh, young people's trajectory around the world. But that job uh, also focused on economic development and entrepreneurship and opportunity for young people. Um, and now I'm at the Aspen Institute where I, I lead a program um, where we seek to promote religious pluralism using at the assets of Aspen um, to, for our convening power, uh, which we're gonna, I'm sure, talk about. What does that look like now? Um, to center best practices in this space and to elevate the role and understanding of faith in public life. And so what are you focused on right now as you try to push away the necessary noise of, of our quarantine? Yeah, so if I can say, like, have a personal reflection on that and then sure. have kind of an organizational. And the personal is, um, I've been trying to remind myself in every Zoom call and every interaction to be grounded to be positive for my team um, and to be present in every interaction. Um, I think there's a lot of noise, good and bad noise out there. And, um, and my personal reflex is to kind of withdraw. Um, and particularly with respect to social media, it's like, I, I wanna just withdraw. I wanna be you know, around my in-person interactions. Can't, you cannot do that right now because I actually think this is a moment for leadership. I think in the space that we jointly occupy, um, this is a time for us to be forward flexing the things that we normally do in the world. And so, so then I connect that individual, you know, reminder of every day, you know, how I show up in these virtual spaces to um, what, what, how we're shifting and thinking about shifting our focus at Inclusive America. Um, Rabbi Moline, you were at our meeting in Birmingham, you heard me reference earlier. So like really like, you know, our secret sauce has been bringing a multi-sectoral group of people around faith and another issue that's, um, relevant to the local community that we're in. How do you do that virtually? How do you make that connection virtually? You know, so um, in terms of programming, we've just begun to think about um, what are the ways that we, you know, we have something planned in July, maybe that's going to be virtual. So what does that look like pedagogically? And those are maybe medium term conversations. Um, in the short term, what we've decided to do is, there's so many resources out there right now that faith communities are producing, we want to, your repository and a go-to for those things. And so we have this like blog that we're constantly updating with uh, virtual events and, commu um, and communities that you can participate in, um, ways that we can support the most vulnerable, ways that that's already happening with many different faith communities. <clears throat> and then, you know, and then um, so many people have kids at home and maybe have 
also free time, I don't know, um, religious literacy tools for, you know, you and any children in your life. Um, so just trying to provide um, a little bit of a sifting mechanism to all the stuff that's out there and say, like, here's what we think, you know, with this, with respect to this issue um, is what's kind of bubbling to the top of our, of our pot this week. You know, one of the things that's always impressed me about the Inclusive America Project is the breadth of participation of, uh, of the various individuals and communities that are represented around your symbolic table and actually your physical table. How do you manage to reach out so well to both the right and the left in the faith and political communities? That's an excellent question. Um, I think that uh, two things. I, I truly believe that religious pluralism and religious freedom is a, is a unifying issue that has been perceived as a dividing issue or that has been politicized or weaponized to be dividing or, and be divisive. Um, <clears throat> what has been the core of all of our work has been relational. You know, so how do we build relationships our, build ourselves with these different actors so that we understand where they're coming from the essence of why they do the work that they do. Um, and then building those, as you said, metaphorical and physical tables that are often closed door conversations to build trust amongst um, communities, amongst individuals, um, and realize that sometimes that there's that internal trust building is not gonna have a big public profile, but there are very few organizations, Aspen is maybe, um, has a unique qualification to be able to do that, where you know people, coming from the right or the left, ideological or political, don't feel like they're coming in a defensive way, but rather that they're coming to a table that they're mutually setting. Um, and I'll say we can, we are always, um, we are always iterating and we, we could do better. I mean, I think that we have a lot of work to do with non-Abrahamic faith communities. You know, we wanna do outreach to, we just have, we're always thinking about like who um, should be at this table and not in a tokenistic way. But in, if we're really talking about equity and centering faith and equity, then we have to think about who's not there, whose voices are not uh, This is one of those times that your internet is warbling a little bit. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll interrupt what you're saying. Uh, your lips are moving, but the sound isn't coming. And, uh, and I'm going to ask you, um, for the sake of our of our listeners, um, is there something about the small uh, circumstances in which you work, the, the intimacy of which you work, outside of the spotlight of public attention that enables these relationships to flourish among people who are used to the spotlight? Yeah, I mean, we just, we had a meeting anecdotally without, you know, it was Chatham House, but um, it feels like a year ago, but it was early in March where we brought together a group of um, evangelical Christians and Muslims and said, you know, religious freedom is something that has been politicized and weaponized, but actually the religious freedom of one community is a religious freedom for, you know, means a religious freedom for every community. And so, um, can we bring these groups together in a not for attribution, very private way to talk about, you know, frankly, why many religious freedom advocates from um, Christian backgrounds weapon, you know, demonize Islam and, and, and call for Islamophobia. And, um, you know, what, what was interesting about that kind of, um, some of the conversation was number one, that going public sometimes takes us away from the, the goal that we're seeking, like makes us lose congregants or adherents, right? So going public too early. So the trust building takes a long time. Going public too early actually um, goes against uh, the things that we are trying to ultimately all, you know, uh, get to, which is religious freedom for every community, that, that, there, that there's a self-interest piece there and we need to understand that self-interest piece. Um, and then really that a lot of this might start with an in-group function, which is to say, this is not about bridging always between faith communities, but it's about bridging within the faith community. And so how do you mitigate the risk for those willing to go to the margins or the, the edges to engage the other, uh, others, right? How do they not pay such a big cost within their own faith community? Because that's uh, 
that's what we're seeing within evangelical communities that if you do if you share the stage with a muslim like you're ostracized and demonized you know and so um what are the ways that we can look at mitigating um those things and i think that you know and what we heard from every leader who came to these meetings is we need more meetings like this that are not public platforms so i think it's a give and a take you know i mean mm -hmm. a lot a, a lot of us are, are a lot of us are spending a lot of time online now and likely encountering people with whom we do not agree on a lot of things uh, it may be political it may be a religious perspective or it may be a faith entirely are there ways you can recommend to our, our viewers and our listeners that they might be able to use this opportunity to reach out to somebody they know but they find themselves at odds with? What's, what's a good first step? Yeah, I mean, I would say that like, um, I think there's a, a certain things that we should acknowledge and just say, you know, like, number one, we will never be the same again. Our country will never be the same again. Our world will never be the same again, whether it's because of loss of human life, whether it's that this current capitalistic economic model that we're on is gonna change, you know, I mean, like nothing will be, this will be the defining moment for in, in many of our lifetimes um, for us, you know? And I think when you look at kind of the new cycle, which can be, you know, just mind numbing, um, we talk a lot around the economic impact, which we should, but we should not forget that this is a human tragedy um, and that has human consequences. And frankly, when I look at faith communities and interfaith leadership um, and the tools that come from faith leaders and interfaith um, resources, it's, it meets this moment, you know? And so I think that we should think about that asset. And, and so what do I mean by that? I think that, the human connection, it, despite the physical distance, is what we're all seeking, right? Like, how do we navigate these waters that are so bumpy and things change hour by hour um, and find some solace in that? That's what faith leaders like yourself are doing all day long, like every day, all day, right? And, um, and, and so I'm interested in the ways that you're doing that digitally now versus in person and, and to talk about that. Um, but so I think that there are tools and resources out there. And again, we're trying to aggregate them on our blog, which is um, if you uh, just Google Aspen Institute Inclusive America Project, it'll pr point you to resources um, where you can take a first step. Like number one, how do, you, how do you do meetings like this in a meaningful way online? You know, that there are expertise out there. And I don't mean like business meetings. I mean like meetings that actually um, make people feel better, you know, in this moment of like great dislocation and isolation. Um, and then, you know, just looking at like the, the tools and resources that we have to do interfaith engagement, we know this stuff. We know how to do this stuff. Like this is, this is a moment that the rest of humanity is calling for like the things that we do every day. And so how do we think about and use those? And I'd love to help, you know, you and other faith leaders like yourselves, uh, such as yourself, think about that. Um, because I don't, I don't have the answers. I, I think some of it, and, and you'll correct me if you think I'm wrong, some of it is just being open to opportunities that may not present themselves in other circumstances. Uh, I'll give you a brief personal example. Um, my brother and my sister and I live many miles apart. Um, and among our fondest memories from when we were kids was gathering around our parents' table at Passover to celebrate Seder together. Because we have our own lives and our own families, we haven't been able to do that for close to 40 years. And we realized in talking with each other this past week that this year we actually can all be together because none of us is going to be hosting a group of people in our homes and all of us are fluent in this technology. So that is certainly something that is causing a reunion and an extremely warm feeling among us because otherwise it never would have happened again, likely in our lifetimes. So sometimes the opportunity presents itself because of the adverse circumstances we're under. Absolutely, and that, you know, I think we like put labels on things like how do we do dialogue or interfaith engagement and like, but really it's, this is human connection. And so whereas we may not be leading with like our faith identity or our faith hat, the reason that we're trying to do this outreach and cultivate community, whether it's me reaching out to my 70 year old neighbor and saying, I'll go get your groceries, um, those tools are still useful. We still, we can still, you know, like lean on that stuff that we know in the space that we occupy um, day to day in a place that's maybe new to some people who um, are busy with their day to day and don't think about, you know, well, how do I, um, 
answer the spiritual vacuum that I might feel or whatever, you know, I find with myself for myself, it's, I'm much more willing to reach out to people because uh, my generally I would say to myself, well, they're probably busy. And right now I know they probably are not. <laughs> so <laughs> it gives me kind of permission um, to reach out and say, how are you doing? And we, we have this like shared moment of vulnerability that, um, that I think faith communities and faith leaders can reach out to meet that moment in, in a beautiful and meaningful way. And so this doesn't just become like about, you know, the economics, the hard things, but actually these like soft things that are inside. I don't want to say soft things, but these, uh, these other things that are so important to nurture as we are going to deal with cycles of grief and, and illness and, you know, death and economic dislocation. Like we actually need the things that faith communities provide more than ever right now. And I know that, uh, that the Inclusive America Project has taken as its guiding principle from the very beginning, the motto of the United States, e pluribus unum, that uh, we are one from among the many or out of the many has come one. Um, I'll offer you the opportunity just to say a few concluding words about how that motto is going to help guide your work going forward. That's a great question. Um, I, you know, I think I, if I situate myself in the Aspen Institute, um, the thing that the Aspen Institute is really well known for are our public events, putting ideas in the culture. And so we're going through this moment of like great shift within our organization, just as every organization, every institution is, you know, to say like, what does, how do you do meaning making if you are taking stuff online and if the model is going to look different. And so I feel again, like we are at an advantage as faith leaders and interfaith leaders um, who sit in this space to say like, the, you know, we've thought about social dislocation. We've thought about the least of these, like we know how to activate around um, communities in need. Uh, and so we can bring those assets to re revisioning or envisioning an organization that's gonna meet the moment. And so some of what I've been thinking about is how do we think about this work vis-a-vis -vis Aspen um, and bring the assets of every of um, the leaders in the space in the circle um, that we work in to these bigger issues. Um, well, Zina, Zina, I, just thinking about this, you know, looking at the federal um, economic stimulus package and seeing what does that mean for nonprofits. So, so yeah. I. Can you hear me? I, I hear you fine, and, and I am uh, just grateful for the time you've taken to spend with us today. We've reached the end of the, uh, the 20 minutes we've set aside for this. Far too little for us to get into some of these issues much more deeply, but necessary for you to get back to your family and, and me to get back to mine. Um, I can't do anything but wish well to you, Zinat, in your, in your circumstances now and to the Inclusive America Project one of my favorite organizations in the space that I'm privileged to spend my time. And uh, I thank you for being with us. I, I wish you and I wish all of our viewers and listeners uh, the hope that they will stay home and stay focused. And we'll see thank you tomorrow. You thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Bye-bye.